fine element analysis, control systems, computational fluid dynamics. He has been part of the development of features and toolkits of the MSC Adams package and is in charge, most importantly, for the MSC academic program in Italy, uh, supporting several courses throughout um, several universities in Italy. And uh, last but not least, I would like to mention that Mr. Catalani is the co-author of uh, an important monograph, which is called Kinematics and Dynamics of Multibody Systems, Volume 2, as well as he has been also co-authoring several scientific and technical publications. I personally know Mr. Catalani as being a wonderful speaker and instructor, so I am very sure, uh, confident that you will uh, thoroughly enjoy his workshop. Before we uh, get started today, I would like to just mention a few rules, okay, to attend the webinar. Um, let me let, let me just uh, try to share my screen in order to show you some of these rules. Okay, so by sharing the screen, okay, this uh, will be actually uh, done by Mr. Catalani. Okay, uh, you will have two options. One, uh, if you want to interact with Mr. Catalani, you can raise your hand. Uh, and this function is actually in the horizontal toolbar in the bottom part of the Zoom um, window. On the other hand, you can uh, type in uh, questions in the Q&A function that you still see in the horizontal toolbar, okay, in the bottom part. You type in questions and it will uh, see the questions and provide answers either um, as live answers or uh, typing in. So please let's uh, use all these tools, okay, to have a smooth interaction um, on the fly while Mr. Catalani is guiding you through this workshop. So welcome again, each and every of you. Uh, you are uh, going to be, let's say, the beginners of uh, these technical activities within Nodicon 2021. So I'm very glad uh, that you took part in it. So Mr. Catalani, thanks very much. The floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Carbonara, and thank you very much for your uh, introduction. I am honored uh, to be part of this event. And uh, OK, let, let me. Uh, sh uh, show myself a little bit in order to uh, have in mind my my face for some seconds and now i can start with my uh, presentation i and uh, please uh, i ask uh, to confirm that you are looking my my screen Yes, absolutely, okay. Mr. Perfect. Calhani, thanks. Perfect. Okay, so again, uh, this is the title of this introduction. And uh, what is the uh, starting point uh, of computer-aided engineering? We can say that everything started at, uh, in the pioneer period uh, during uh, Apollo mission at NASA. And uh, in the top of this slide, you see two guys in particular, McNeil and Schindler, they developed the first release of uh, a famous finite element code uh, developed for a, a spatial application, and the code is called the Nastran. And the name Nastran is evident, which it was developed as starting for a NASA project. Uh, from this period, there the was a great evolution. And for example, today, the, the code like uh, this one is used uh, uh, in uh, many, many, many applications. This is, uh, for example, one of the uh, big last uh, results we achieved, uh, uh, for example, for the development of the Vega uh, rocket, which is uh, a, a very uh, great successful from Italian uh, uh, 
team and Italian and European, uh, European project. And uh, looking at this movie, uh, you can understand uh, the reason of the importance of simulation. This is a typical uh, uh, design in which you have only one shot. You cannot create uh, prototypes and tests. Uh, looking and uh, uh, hoping that everything goes well. You have to use massively simulation in order to take into account uh, mechanical problem, aerodynamic problem, acoustic problem, thermal problem, and not uh, as isolated uh, uh, problems, but uh, all together. So you have to create a mathematical representation in a multidisciplinary and multi-physic field in order to evaluate every possible configuration, every possible variant of your project, in order to find the best uh, configuration of parameters to make the mission, to make the project successful. What is performed in, uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this field, for example, is the need to uh, simulate the burning of uh, the engine of a rocket. And uh, when you have to test it uh, in the lab, you must be sure that everything goes well because a, an error, a problem, a mistake uh, can have a catastrophic effect, uh, not only from the uh, expenses point of view, so you, lo you waste a lot of money, but uh, it's, it's uh, dangerous. You can see here another movie in which there is uh, the fire burning of this engine. And you can appreciate uh, from the movie that you have to guarantee the functionality of this engine for the full period of the la launch. And uh, you can see also from the movie that there are a lot of things to, to consider, vibration, thermal effect, mechanical effect, acoustic effect. So how you can achieve good results? Using the simulation or using also the simulation, combining the knowledge, the capability, and the numerical test with the experimental test, finding the good balancing between these two methods which must be worked together in order to achieve the, the results. So the history of simulation is very close to the history of my company. Uh, as I told you, we started at the beginning of uh, 60 years during the mission Apollo, Apollo mission. And uh, in that period, the first code were developed principally on the structural uh, point of view. So we saw, uh, tool for structural analysis for uh, linear and nonlinear finite element analysis, the first uh, uh, interaction between a structure and fluid, the first interaction between uh, thermal effect and the structural effect. In the second period of the evolution, we saw the first application of multidiscipline activity. Many co other codes were developed and they started work together. For example, the introduction of the multibody dynamics, the introduction of the mechatronic, the analysis of fatigue, durability. And this code um, gave, provide another uh, effort, another importance to the uh, design because we had the possibility to investigate many other activity, for example, the movement, the movement with controls, the flexibility with the movement and the controls, etc., etc. And more recent, uh, the activity of the devolution and the development of the code is much more focused on the trends of the industry for zero, for example, the machine learning, the virtual reality, the new material development, the electrification of vehicle, and the additive manufacturing. So this is more or less the uh, evolution of the tools. For sure, we had also in parallel the evolution of the computer. So 
now we are able to perform a very realistic simulation in an acceptable amount of time from engineering point of view because we have a powerful tool in our hands starting from a big computer uh, uh, which needs a full room to, to store all the machine now we can use our laptop or our desk to run a very complex simulation in a very very short amount of time the evolution of the code was uh, um, uh, driven also by many companies many industries from many different fields from the automotive from the aerospace from spatial from robotics from general machinery they push a lot the development of they ask a lot for the development of the simulation in order to make the tools more powerful more uh, <clears throat> wide more integrated more easy to use and they ask continuously new features and new capabilities. The world of simulation is uh, very wide. We have uh, the multi-body dynamics, but we have also the structural analysis and the CFD analysis and the controls analysis and the thermal and acoustic analysis. And we can add other uh, functionalities. And, but we want have to consider, we, today we don't more simulate using one single tool in an isolated discipline but we need to integrate all different disciplines all different tools using a common model able to simulate different aspects of your reality and why we have to simulate at the beginning of a project why today we start immediately with the simulation because the, every decision you take at the, in the early design of your project has a great impact on the cost of your project. Because if you, if you don't create any physical prototype, if you don't spend any money to buy material to create the, the, the pro product, if you don't spend money to sell the product, you are in a comfort zone in which you can decide modification of your project because you are free to change everything with no any consequence. But in the moment you deliver the project and you start to uh, run physical tests and then you start to produce and then you start to sell, if you have to go back because something is wrong, you have to restart all the project and imagine all the time and all the money you have spent to create the product, to sell the product, and also imagine the impact on your brand if your product is in the market and you have to call back because something is not good. So, <clears throat> At the beginning of the computer-aided engineering, the tools were introduced when the design was completed. Because at the beginning of the uh, usage of simulation, we need to become expert in simulation. So we need to familiarize ourselves with the simulation tools and methodology. But after a period of learning, uh, the tool were um, pushed to start immediately at the beginning of the project. Again, because in that uh, period of the project, you are free to change every parameter. You, have, you are free to invent new configuration. You can try also dangerous analysis, you can test also failure analysis with no any consequence in terms of money, in terms of uh, risk in your lab, or in, in terms of the brand of your product. So the main goal of simulation is reduce physical prototypes, reduce money to spend, reduce time 
improve the quality of the product and investigate, explore new configuration, new variants of your project because you have the possibility to run parametric analysis, design of experiment analysis, optimization analysis on your numerical model. So when you run a simulation, you, you can see if your idea, your product work correctly. So you can appreciate the performances of your model, of your component, of your system. But you can also evaluate if your system is able to resist at specific loads. You can also investigate if you go over the limits of the loads you, you want to use every day. So my system can work in any condition or which are the limits of my, of my system. And if something goes wrong, what, what is the situation around my system? If I work in a collaborative environment, there is the risk and danger also for people. I can simulate this condition and I can improve my requ the requirements. I can address the requirements. And also today, I can simulate the manufacturing process. So I can Im immediately understand if my component and my system can be created, can be realized because I can use forming process or uh, additive manufacturing process or other process to create, to create it. Another great uh, success uh, we had recently also, again with NASA, was the simulation and the project of the rover and the uh, landing on the Mars surface. Curiosity, spirit, uh, opportunity. The last uh, um, uh, rover were developed at JPL using uh, Adam's code, which is the multibody code. And also, we the code is used uh, are used in uh, automotive industry, in uh, machinery industries for powertrain simulation for uh, landing simulation for uh, um, uh, packaging uh, simulation in, in which you have to simulate the gears, cable, chain, belts. Um, you need to simulate motor, electrification, uh, combination between uh, uh, mo motion and control, etc., cetera, et cetera. Some application, for example, is for uh, the uh, brake analysis or for uh, uh, structural analysis of a car or for uh, the thermal uh, uh, coupling between the, uh, the structure and the, the, uh, and the temperature field or uh, crash analysis, et cetera, et cetera. And the same for aerospace uh, industries in which you want to simulate stress effect, or you need to simulate uh, best strike uh, phenomena, or you need to simulate uh, uh, extraction and retraction, or the landing and takeoff of an aircraft or uh, an helicopter. So every system can be optimized. And we have also the same for non-transportation industry, you, you need to simulate a pneumatic system, you need to simulate cooling system, or for example, you need to simulate uh, operation on uh, off-road uh, of, uh, of your vehicle. Or typical uh, consumer good uh, product in which you have a thermal stress problem or seal problem, or also Me uh, mechanism for opening closing circuit uh, and also drop test analysis for example of your of your uh, mobile phone something like uh, like this the fact that the simulation uh, today is used uh, extensively in the in the different industry uh, has been uh, certified by, by many many customers by many research center and the the trend is also towards the certification and validation by virtual analysis so today the tools are so good 
so complete, for sure, used by people able to use in the correct way these tools, that some analysis can be used to certify a project. And the simulation is used also to innovate, to push the innovation in the, in the industry. So let me uh, start with some example. Uh, only some slides for giving you the overview about what I want to, to show later with the workshop. So we have uh, our uh, system to represent from mathematical point of view. So the first thing of an engineer, a designer has to do is to be able to represent it in a mathematical way. So we need to know the geometry characteristics, the structural characteristics, the material characteristics. We need to know how to simulate the loads, the constraints. And it's important to know which are the analysis we want to perform and which are the output we want to, to get. You have in front of you a very strong tool and depending on your choices, depending on your knowledge, depending on your uh, uh, re request, you can have a simple model, very, very complex model, intermediate model. You can grow yourself with your model. You can introduce uh, in the model dummy parameters or very sophisticated and realistic parameters. You can ask 10 things, 10 measures on your results, or you can also get a terabyte of results. And you need to know how to manage these things. If you don't know how to decide how to use your structural elements, you, you cannot create a mathematical representation. So remember always that you have in your hands tools, but you are the master of the analysis. Your de the decision depends on you. And if you use dummy data or incomplete data, result will be incomplete. So remember always that there is no any magic button in the tools that make the activity for you. You, you are the brain of the methodology. And the tool is a, a, a tool, a weapon in your, in your hands. So you need to know the difference between the material. You need to know the difference between loads and constraints. And you need to know which are the analysis you want to perform. It's very different if you run a linear analysis or a aerolastic analysis. The model needs different components, different statement, different uh, parameters, and also the output will be different. And you have, you need to have the capability to extract the results you need from this big amount of data you can have. Let me give you a, an example uh, uh, about uh, the development of a new business jet. So, for example, you have to challenge, you have to de uh, design a new aircraft uh, more uh, focused on the trend of the market. So, a green, aircraft, uh, you need to improve the comfort uh, in the passenger cabin, you have to reduce the noise, you need to fly a high velocity, you have to optimize the weight and the structure. So you have to satisfy many different requirements. And one of these requirements for sure is the, the cost of your product. So you have a budget and you have a limit in the, in the cost of your project. If you are not able to satisfy all these requirements from mathematical point of view, from technical point of view, and from economic point of view, you, are, you are, cannot have success in the project. So considering the different things you have to design, to simulate, you have to, uh, if you focus our attention only in, the, in this aircraft, only on the cockpit, we have the pilot floor to design. We have a transition floor from the cockpit to the passenger cabin to design. We need to de define the region in which we have the nose landing gear. 
and we also to have to define the region we have the canopy and the windshield with different materials and with different problem with respect to the rest of the structure. And this is a typical multidisciplinary problem which requires a multidisciplinary approach. Many tools, many departments have to work together. You need an interface able to integrate the different tools with the different disciplines and the different people which have to work all together. And for example, we had to run a typical aeroelastic analysis for load evaluation. And to run this analysis, we need to have an aerodynamic model. So the aerodynamic department has to provide you all the data able to be uh, reported, uh, distributed on the structural uh, part of the aircraft in order to extract the aeroelastic effect. In this case, your model is much more oriented on this kind of modelization. So, for example, from a structural point of view, you have a specific representation of your model because you need to run very complex simulation, but you have to run many, many simulation. So the model must be simplified from some point of view and sophisticated from another point of view. And you can evaluate, for example, the, re the re response to a gust. So to a, a very um, dramatic uh, phenomena you can have during the landing year and the takeoff of your, of your aircraft. And you have to see which is the effect of the gust on every section on, of, your, uh, of your aircraft. So you have to evaluate acceleration, you have to evaluate force, you have to evaluate uh, a moment. And you extract the specific results and store them. Then you go to the next uh, analysis, which is the evaluation from structural point of view of the floors of the cockpit. And you start with uh, a detailed representation of the floor because you have to evaluate locally the results. So you, you use the same model, but you increase, improve the modelization of the floor. And you introduce 2D and 3D elements on your finite element model. And you run specific linear and nonlinear analysis in order to evaluate the stress. And if you have points, region in which you violate the stress limit, you have to review your, your model. But you don't have only the, the floor. You have only also the a region in the, in the cockpit, in the aircraft, in which you have the landing gear. And you have to consider the extraction and the retraction of the landing gear. And you have to consider, you have to avoid interferences during the extraction or retraction. You cannot accept that the landing gear goes in contact with the structures. And the landing gear during the movement uh, apply loads on the region of the cockpit. And the loads changes because there are aerodynamic effects. Imagine that when you extract the landing gear, their aerodynamic force is applied to the structure of the landing gear. And this force is transferred to the structure of the cockpit. So you have to consider the specified, the specific modelization of the uh, landing gear box, and you have to consider the possibility of contact. And you have to evaluate these interferences. And you, in this case, you can see if you can have a problem and which kind of problem you can have. Then you have to consider the canopy and the windshield. For example, for the bird strike simulation, which is one of the most dangerous situation you can have. An impact with a bird or an impact with an object during the flight. And you have to simulate it because uh, you cannot destroy 1,000 of different windshield and canopy during your design. Otherwise, you 
spend a lot of money only for physical tests. But num from a numerical point of view, you can simulate different uh, points of impact and you can appreciate which are the most dangerous situation and which are the effect of the impact. So you simulate the impact on the canopy, you simulate the impact on the windshield, and you can appreciate results in terms of stress and deformation. And from numerical point of view, you can run thousands of these different analyses. And uh, when you have to validate your cockpit, uh, you go in the lab and you test it with one single physical test. And you have validated your model using the, the good balancing between numerical simulation and physical, and physical test. But this is not enough. You can also, they need to simulate the forming process, for example, of the canopy. So you have the material, you have the machine for uh, defining the forming process, and you have to simulate it because during the forming process, the structural characteristic of your structure can change. And if you don't consider this modification from structural point of view, you can have, you can get um, wrong results and bad behavior of your, uh, of your system. So you need also to simulate this kind of, of process. And also from this process, you can see distribution of stress and deformation. So we start from aerodynamic model. We simulate uh, linear analysis for uh, static load. We introduce dynamic load and contact uh, loads for uh, extraction retraction of the landing gear. We simulate uh, high speed phenomena for uh, beard strike effect. We simulate the forming process using the same tool and mod different uh, modelization of the same model, different uh, uh, statement, different uh, sequence of uh, element, uh, different combination of, of loads, but using the same model of, your, of our aircraft. And at the end on this, we can also apply a multi-body analysis to simulate effectively for example, the landing and the takeoff of your, land, of your landing gear, considering the structural fuselage on the top of the landing gear. So this is one of the example, but we have also other example of this. Let me give you an introduction of the multi-body dynamics. We have a um, complex system made by bodies which can be connected each other the connection are performed by joints, rigid or elastic joint. You can apply on your system any kind of forces, and you want to simulate the, the full envelope, the full uh, maneuver you, you want to simulate. You can simulate the, any kind of event. So you have a very complex system made by rigid, flexible body, rigid joint, flexible joint, different kind of uh, forces, and you simulate the behavior of your, of your system. And you need a numerical analysis for this. And what you can simulate? Potentially everything you are able to model and you are able to simulate. Depends on your competence, depends on your knowledge, depends on your capability to represent the physics depends on the data you have in your hands. If you don't have the data for simulating the soft uh, road, you cannot simulate this kind of uh, phenomena because the track cannot move on a rigid surface. You need to simulate the possibility of the, the, the road to change. You need to simulate the cable. You need to simulate the contact between uh, wheel and uh, tracks you need to simulate the uh, payload um, 
re release uh, of, uh, of a satellite in the space, considering the orbital movement of the rocket, considering the uh, temperature of the space, considering the flexibility of uh, the structure during the opening uh, of the fairing. And this is not enough. You can have combination of biomechanics and uh, a motorbike. You cannot simulate the behavior of a motorbike if you don't take into account the human body. You cannot simulate a packaging problem if you are not able to simulate gears or cams or uh, uh, belt or chain. You cannot simulate uh, wind energy analysis if you don't consider the aerolisticity effect, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if we go in detail on uh, this, I can show you another example. For example, we want to simulate the helicopter ship deck operation. The purpose is we want to reduce the number of physical tests in order to certify and validate our model, but maintaining the, the goodness of our project. So if running thousands, hundreds of thousands of simulation with every different condition of our helicopter during the maneuver of approach and landing on a carrier and of uh, mooring of the, the helicopter on the carrier ship. Let me show you the, the maneuver we want to reproduce numerically. So we are in a open sea uh, scenario. We have uh, the carrier moving and oscillating on the sea and we have the helicopter as to land on the carrier. And it is different condition with respect to helicopter landing on Earth, because we have a move, movable ship and we have very different aerodynamic situation. We, we have wind investing the helicopter longitudinally, laterally, with the modification of the forces depending on the obstacle the wind can find. So you have to consider different uh, situation. And this is another typical situation. After the helicopter has landed, the pilot uh, ramped down the motor. But unfortunately, can happen that there is a coupling effect between the structural behavior of the, the blades and the aerodynamic uh, forces. And it means that in this case, we have a flapping movement of the blades uh, in a, let me say, dramatic way. So the, the blades oscillate too much. So the helicopter must be stopped and removed from the flight operation because probably the loading condition has um, created some problems from structural point of view. And you can imagine the, the cost for a company to remove an helicopter from the line. The company has to have another helicopter or has to stop its activity. So to, to, be, the, the, to be a, a winner in this, uh, in this industry, in this field, my helicopter must be stopped uh, less uh, than the, the, my competitor. I have to reduce, oh sorry, I have to expand the time for maintenance. I have to uh, be sure that my helicopter is not uh, uh, in a dangerous situation. I have to evaluate the fatigue and durability effect of the blade. So I have to consider all of these things. And this is another typical multidisciplinary problem. We have a structural model of the blades. We have CFD code providing aerodynamic forces. We have the multi-body code for the ship and the helicopter model. And in all these disciplines, we have different parameters. For example, the weight of the helicopter, the position of the landing gears, the pressure of the tires, 
the characteristic of the shock absorber, the speed of the rotor, the characteristic of the blades, the, fo the force of the wind. So you have all of these things to consider. So you have to run many, many different analyses in order to consider all different configuration. And depending on the complexity of your representation, you can simulate simple wind model or very complex model. And you grow with your model and you become more and more expert in your model. And when you become expert in your model, you can simulate also the mooring effect. That is how the helicopter is um, fixed to the carrier through cables. So you simulate the, how many cables you need, the distribution of the cable on the carrier, the tension of the cable. And you have to consider if the ship is moving or if the landing gear is uh, uh, perfect or you have problem in the landing gear, if the cable are, have the good uh, tension, etc., etc. And uh, if you don't consider this, uh, when you have uh, your helicopter on your carrier, you can have uh, great uh, oscillation of your helicopter. And you know this is a typical ground stability problem and if you don't have the right design you can find that the helicopter move on the carrier and you can imagine the problem you you have in this case because the helicopter can can uh, be can become a great risk for people for the crew or, or for equipment of the of the carrier. So you have to run thousands of simulation, considering everything, different cables distribution, different cable tension, different rotor speed, etc, etc, etc. And this is another typical design of experiment analysis. And the user run thousands of these analysis and extract, evaluate, and investigate the, all the condition, all the configuration. So we speak a lot about uh, multidiscipline analysis. And when we talk about the multidiscipline, we consider multibody plus structure, multibody plus CFD, multibody plus controls, fluid plus structures, thermal plus structures, thermal plus fluid, all, all together. And considering the different disciplines, you need to have a great environment to manage all these disciplines and a great environment to allow the users, all the users, to collaborate in order to improve the model when it needs, to simplify the model when you, you can simplify, to run single solvers to run co-simulation between solvers to extract automatically plots, diagrams, animation, report, etc., etc. And this is another typical example. If we want to simulate, for example, a crash of an helicopter during the, the landing, you need a multi-body analysis able to provide all the initial data of movement to the crash code, and you need a transfer, automatic transfer of information from the multibody code to the crash code to consider this kind of analysis, for example. Or if you want to simulate the full flight of an aircraft, considering how the mobile surface can rotate, which is the thrust of the engine, which is the extraction speed of our landing gear, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You need to simulate a mechatronic model, including the avionic of the aircraft, together with the, the mechanical part. And this is a typical co-simulation between the mechanical solver 
and the control solver. Or if you need to consider the simulation of a motorbike, you have to define the biomechanics of the uh, of a of a of a, um, of a man, of a pilot, of a driver, of a rider, and you can have a simplified representation or a sophisticated representation, considering also the bones, the muscles of the of the rider, because it's the rider that controls the motorbike. Or in another application, you have to consider the combustion forces or the stiffness along the wires of springs or the contact forces in a chain and a sprocket model, etc., etc. And if these bodies become flexible, you can appreciate the formation and stresses. And the simulation, simulation change completely because you introduce another discipline in your, uh, in your model. Or if you want to simulate uh, the wind energy problem, you can consider the gear model of a planetary included in a pylon, included with a blade and aerodynamic applied on the blade. And you can have this kind of transmission system, which is uh, simulated not as isolated submodel, but uh, as a part of a bigger model. And everything is much more complex if your wind tower is not positioned on the, on the Earth, but in open sea, because you have also the hydrodynamic forces applied on the tower. So your modelization change again. Or if you want to consider the robotics or machinery environment, you have to control the end effector trajectory of your robot, or you have to control the uh, vibration of your uh, washing machine, etc., etc. This is another example I want to show you before to start with the workshop. Here we have a typical um, activity in the automotive industry. When you are uh, working in a motorsport, you, you have to simulate uh, phenomena in which you have uh, not only the vehicle dynamics, but vehicle dynamics plus uh, aerodynamic forces. And uh, you have to consider the track on which your car is, is uh, moving. And you have to simulate also the irregularities of the truck and you have to simulate uh, the behavior of the tires if you neglect something uh, in uh, this uh, analysis your simulation is poor is limited gives you some information but not the full representation of the reality you have to consider the elasticity effect when you have a mobile surface with uh, the possibility to deform because the deformation change the aerodynamic field and the change in the aerodynamic field change the structural characteristics and it is a loop it is a coupling effect so you have to consider this and you have many different ways. you can decide which part of your vehicle is flexible and you represent it in a finite element code and import this result in a multi-body code you can decide how to describe the aerodynamic effect on the mobile surface and you can have distributed or lumped or um, stored or in co-simulation way aerodynamic force applied on your vehicle and during the simulation you evaluate different situation in which you move on the full lap of a circuit or you focus your attention on a specific region of your circuit and then you extract results in terms of angles position deformation velocity 
derivative of the formation, acceleration, second derivative of the formation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you use all this data, your model can become more and more precise. And you can simulate completely a vehicle on a circuit, considering also the curves, so the car is moving on the curves, changing the global position of the vehicle on a, a, a 3D space, but also considering the deformation of the mobile surface. And if you have aerodynamic forces applied on this mobile surface, you can appreciate how the dynamic forces change at every milliseconds, for example, at every seconds on the mobile sur 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 surface, affecting the behavior of your car. So you have results with no aerodynamic forces, with aerodynamic forces on a rigid surface, with aerodynamic forces with, on a flexible surface. And if you don't consider everything, or if you skip something, or if you neglect something, your result will be different. And you have to know this. And it's up to you to decide the complexity of your uh, modelization. Today, it's possible to run very complex simulation using the power of the co-simulation, for example, between multiple and CFD code in considering aerodynamic effect or hydrodynamic effect like this. Okay, this is the first uh, introduction I have uh, performed now. And we can uh, start with the um, workshop. I send you uh, through uh, the Nodicom uh, organization the tool Adams. Today we will use only one of these tools, but uh, with many other things. Adams uh, must be installed uh, on your laptop. Is an executable. You, uh, you have. A, I hope you have already installed it on your laptop. And I have sent you also uh, files to be used during this workshop. So when you have installed Adams, you have an icon on your laptop, on your desktop, or an icon on your working directory. Double click on this icon, and the Adams interface is open it in front of you. So this is the main window of uh, Adams. Uh, you can read here Adams Student Edition because this is a limited uh, release of Adams. Uh, we gave, uh, we give for free to students, all the students of university in the world. It contains all the features of Adams, but uh, you are able to create uh, uh, mo model with uh, a limited number of bodies. So it is good for making this kind of this uh, operation, this activity, learning activity, to familiarize with the code. You cannot uh, use uh, this student edition for uh, create a sophisticated model like you see before uh, for aircraft and helicopter and vehicle uh, case study. So the first thing I ask you when you have opened the Adams view window is to go to existing model. A dialog box is displayed in front of you. And you have to move on your laptop, searching the working directory in which you have stored the file I gave you. The files are in CMD format, and this file already contain models we can use together for this workshop. So the first thing I ask you is to select the working directory, and then to search in the file name field 
using this icon or simply double clicking with the left button of the mouse in this field, you search for the first file, call it one flap CAD, and you select this file, and then clicking on OK, this file is loaded on the screen. Now, some words, some information about the usage of the interface. As I told you, I cannot, we have no time for a, a full training, so I give you some basic information. If you want to rotate, translate, zoom your model on the screen, you can use or the icons here in the top, or you can use the keyboard. So, for example, clicking the icon with the two arrows here, you activate the rotating option, maintaining the clicking the left button of the mouse, you can rotate the model on the screen. When you release the left button of the mouse, you release this option and you have to click again to activate this option. The same functionality, if you click, simply click the R as Romeo on your keyboard. To translate, there is another icon. The, the symbol is an, a hand and you can translate the model on the screen. On the keyboard, you can click T as Tango, so you can translate. The length is for zooming. Z like Zulu for zooming. And a length in a region is for uh, zoom a specific uh, region. So you click this icon, then you select the region and you zoom specific region. W like whiskey in the, on the keyboard. So Z, rotate, translate, zooming and windowing in this way. What we have uh, on our uh, window, we have many icons, sun, ribbon to visualize and to access different uh, components of a multi-body model, like the rigid body or the flexible body, like the joints, like the motions or the forces or generic element, or for running a simulation, or for visualizing results in terms of plot, table, report, and animation. This is the main window in which you can visualize graphically your model and components. And here on the left, you have the browser of your model, so you can expand every single family of object, so you can access every single element from this window. You have two ways for doing it, selecting on the screen or selecting on the model browser. For sure, you have uh, thousands of other commands. If you navigate in the graphic user interface, you can find, uh, realistically speaking, thousands of different uh, other options. But uh, we focus our attention on uh, this main window and the model browser. So if I rotate, translate, and zoom, I can appreciate how my model 
is created. I have created the model using a combination of internal geometrical element to assign a geometry to my body and through import a model from a CAD uh, modeler. So what we have performed? We want to perform a full investigation on this device, which is a flap, a high relief device on an aircraft. You know the importance of this device on an aircraft. When you have close to the landing or during the takeoff on an aircraft, you, the, the, the pilot has to extend the flap in order to increase the surface uh, covered by the wind, the hair, so to increase the surface for the uh, um, lift force of the aircraft and to change the orientation of the surface with respect to the wind to change the angle of attack of the, the force. This is because during the landing and the takeoff, the speed of the aircraft is uh, smaller than the, the speed during the cruise of the, 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 the aircraft. So you have to compensate with the higher surface and higher angle of attack, the reduction of the speed. To make this investigation, you have to use different disciplines because you have different problem. You have to consider the vehicle dynamics of the aircraft, but the flap, the wing, every part of the aircraft is flexible. So you have to consider the structural characteristics. You are moving in the air, so we have to consider the flight loads applied on the aircraft you have a mechanism. So you have to consider how the links are moving all together and they move one with respect to the other. So you have to consider the, the position of uh, bodies, joints, uh, stopper. You have to consider the elastic force in the, in the joints, etc. You have a control system an hydraulic actuator, a pneumatic actuator, an electronic electric actuator, you have something that uh, drive the system and you have the avionic to drive, to help the, the, the pilot to, uh, to fly the, the aircraft. So you have to consider all of these things. And uh, during the design, you move from scratch, so you have nothing in front of you, to the final definition of your, of your flap. So this is a typical uh, scenario in which you have to move. So you have the pilot input, and this is transformed from analog to digital command. You have the computer for the application of the loads from the pilot input to the elevators, to the rudder, to every mobile surface. You have the control of the surface and you have to consider the mechanism part, the hydraulic part, but also the logic to drive the system. So you have to simulate this kind of model. And you start to simulate the mechani mechanical part and then the hydraulic part, and then the two part combined, integrated, and then you have to consider the flexibility, etc., cetera, et cetera. We cannot simulate them separately. Otherwise, our model is limited. And we need to use, as in the past, a lot of physical tests 
very expensive and which uh, increase the development time and we have the possibility to investigate also other combination with respect to the past. For example, this is a typical iron bird physical testing. So you have in the lab a representation of your aircraft and we have to make a digital representation of this in our virtual environment. And to get these results, we need to have a virtual integrated environment in which moment you can simulate only a portion of your system or combined analysis and you can increase the complexity or simplify the model depending on the purposes of your analysis. Again, we want to reduce the risk and the cost and we want to improve the quality of your system. Uh, we cannot uh, for sure eliminate the physical prototype, but we need to reduce the number of this physical prototype. So we will use today Adams multi-body environment. We can use uh, a logic uh, control system like this for making the hydraulic environment. We can use a structural tool for uh, introducing flexibility, and we can use a CFD tool for defining the CFD aerodynamic forces. And we move in this way from the first part of the model till the full model, which include all the other disciplines. What we have performed together some minutes ago is this we have defined the model importing the CAD model. But the CAD model is imported because we have already performed some activity before to import it. To import, it. To import a CAD model, is, it's easy. The code is, uh, can uh, import any kind of CAD model from all the players in the world. And we can ma manipulate the geometry in order to assign material to define mass and inertia to define the joints. But what we want to do now is to run kinematic on the model and then a dynamic on the model. So we want to evaluate the ideal behavior of the system and then a realistic uh, behavior of the system. In this kinematic analysis, we don't include vibration, we don't include uh, uh, flexibility. We, in, the, in this analysis, we include uh, flexibility, compliances, clearances, etc. And to include the flexibility, we have to transform a rigid body in a finite element body. So we have to consider the deformation and the stress characteristics of the body. And instead of using a simple motor to move the, the, the flap, we have to include a hydraulic model or a similar model, which allows us to run co-simulation analysis between the mechanical part and the hydraulic part. And at the end, we simulate the full flight of our, of our aircraft. So what is the first step? The first step is something that is performed in the company from the uh, mechanical department. We have some requirements. We have to design the flap and our flap has to move considering the shape of a wing and we have no any authority on the, of the wing. So the wing is defined by the aerodynamic department. 
we can only decide how, which is the portion of the wing we can consider with the flap. And we have another requirement, which is the need for the flap to be extracted and retracted in order to address this rotation, one for the cruise flight, one for the uh, landing, and one for the takeoff uh, analysis. And the other departments, for example, the aerodynamic departments, doesn't care in which way you move the flap. So you can decide which is the mechanism to move the flap. But you have to satisfy these requirements. And these requirements must be achieved without any problem of impact, clearance with the wing, and we know any problem of uh, actuation, and we any problem of uh, uh, failure due to the structural problems, et cetera, et cetera. So it is not easy. We have to start at least allowing the movement of the flap. And we have in front of us only these requirements. So we see the wing, we see the portion of the wing, and we check all different configuration. So we create many multi-body model with the different mechanism, and we run kinematic analysis in order to see if we satisfy the requirements. That is the right extraction of the flap and no interference problem, evaluating also the loading condition in correspondence of the joint, because if the loading condition are too high, probably my mechanism can fail, can have a problem during the, the, during the maneuver. So we select another configuration and we investigate. We select other configuration and we in, uh, investigate. At the end, we decide which, which is the best configuration of our model. So this is a typical kinematic analysis at the preliminary level, very preliminary analysis, but that is fundamental for the future. Without this analysis, you are not able to perform any other kind of analysis because in this, with this analysis, you decide which is the mechanism which allows you to retract and extract the flap, satisfying all the requirements. So I have performed this analysis for you, so you can see some movies on these slides, and you can see that for different uh, simple mechanism, you have good rotation, but, uh, but with violation of, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, contacts, or you have uh, rotation with uh, um, uh, occupation of volume, uh, which is not acceptable for other uh, reason in, on our uh, aircraft. So we run many, many different uh, analysis. And we save and deliver the choice. And now we are ready to start with a more sophisticated analysis. And this is the, this is the level we start together. So the first part is performed using a, a simple multi-body model. Now, I have chosen the kinematic mechanism. I have, this, I have defined where are the actuators, where are the links, where are the, where are the connections, and we use also the CAD environment 
to make a more realistic representation of our flap. So we start from this point. So, as I told you, we import the first model, and now we navigate in the model to look how it is. We have a flap. This green part is a flap. It is called the rigid flap because for the moment is not flexible. So we maintain our investigation uh, at the preliminary, uh, preliminary, at the preliminary level. So for the moment, we consider it uh, as a rigid mechanism. We go, we can go on the flap with the mouse and we can select modify option and we can see the mass of the flap and the distribution of the inertia on the flap. And this is important because our actuator drive, move a body with mass and inertia. So the actuator has to impose a force, a torque in order to make the flap moving and rotating in the space. If we don't assign the right mass value and inertia distribution, our results in terms of dynamic and structural point of view will be wrong. So even if my model rotates correctly, I don't get the good results in terms of force and torque. So every body in the system has a mass and the inertia. You can see the left spoiler. You can see the, the eye for the actuator, the motor. You can see the sliders here and the same on the, on the upper side of the flap. The rest of the aircraft is not important for us because we focus our attention on the flap and all the body defined by my initial kinematic investigation. So how I define the connection between bodies? I can move, for example, in correspondence of this part of the flap, and you can see not only the geometry of our system, but also you can see and appreciate that there are some Cartesian coordinates, and these are important points in which we locate joints and forces. For example, I want to connect the spoiler, which is this part, this uh, um, gray part here, we want to connect it with the rest of the, the flap. So I click uh, connectors button here, you see bodies and you see connectors. And among all the possible connection, I select, for example, this icon, which is an icon for creating a revolute joint, an ing between the spoiler and the flap. So if I click this icon, now I can decide where and how we want to define the connection. So in this window here, we can select the body to connect, two bodies, the position of the connection, one location, and the direction, the orientation of the connection. We want to allow the spoiler to rotate along the axis of the flap. 
So we have to select a geometrical feature in order to find the orientation of the joint. So I switch from this option, normal, to grid, to this option, which is pick geometry feature. And now I move with the mouse on the screen. I go close to the part I want to connect. And using the right button of the mouse, I open a window which allows me to select the body. I want to select the spoiler. OK. And this spoiler must be connected to the slider. So I click again the left, the right button of the mouse, and now I select the slider. Where is the joint? In correspondence of this Cartesian coordinate. You see here the name of the Cartesian coordinate. And I click it. And for the orientation, I search for the z-axis of this Cartesian coordinate because this axis is oriented along the direction of extrusion of the flap. And you can see with this icon that we have created a connection which allows the spoiler to rotate with respect to the flap. Which is the amount of this rotation? We can decide to apply a motion that is an ideal actuation or a force that is a real actuation. We are at the preliminary investigation so we decide to apply a motion to, to actuate this joint. So moving here, searching for motion, I can now select the joint to which I want to apply the motion, and I have only this revolute joint. I click this icon. I move on the screen. And when the name of the joint is displayed on the screen, I click with the mouse. And now a motion is applied on the spoiler. And I can decide the function of this motion. So the speed of the, the opening and closing of the spoiler, the acceleration or the displacement, it's up to me to decide how this motion is applied. Repeating the process for another part of the model, for example, I can uh, zoom in correspondence of the actuator between in this region, I can select another type of connection. So I click on connectors. I search for translational joint which allows a rotation, a translation between two bodies. So one part can move with respect to another part along a specific axis. So I select this joint. And as before, I move on the screen close to the region of connection. Right button of the mouse gives me the possibility to select the eye of the motor. And I click on OK. Again, in this region, right bottom of the mouse, I can select the drive motor, which is the purple part, 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 color, part colored part. The location is in the center of the eye part and the direction is longitudinal to the 
I part. So you can see the axial direction of the translational joint. And this is the daikon showing you how this part can move with respect to the other part. And we can insist, sorry, we can repeat this uh, activity for creating the body, uh, the connection between bodies using fixed joint, cardanic joint, planar joint, spherical joint, or other kind of connections. If you go to tools and search for read command file, now we are ready to load the second model in which I have already created for you the full mechanism. So you can go to tools read command file and you can read the flap kinematic model the file called it to flap kinematic model you see that we have now the same model as before i only have uh, removed the visibility of the aircraft but the aircraft is in the model but now we have all the connection in the model. And uh, in the model browser, you can appreciate the joint we created all together, the motion we create all together, the translational joint uh, we have created uh, together here, but also other connection and other joint I have created in order to make the model complete. We have rotation of the spoiler and we have motion applied to the flap that is applied to the actuator to allow the flap to extract and to be retracted. I have used motion, so ideal actuator. They, these are not forces. I apply a motion, so a function in which the function is well known. I can see this function. If I go on the motion and I click on modify, I see the function. And the function is a transient law which allows the flap to be moved in some seconds from the initial position to the full extracted position. This is a kinematic model. In fact, if you go to tools, model verify you can find that the system has zero degree of freedom so it is a perfect kinematic model the model is successfully verified why this model is important because now i can run many kinematic analysis investigating many different situations and plotting results, evaluating the goodness of the mechanism, evaluating the performance of the mechanism, evaluating what happens if something goes wrong during the maneuver. So I can simulate also failure analysis. Let me start with a simple maneuver. So finally, after this long introduction, I go to simulation button here. I search for this icon, which means run an interactive simulation. 
And in this dialog box, you can select the duration of your maneuver, for example, eight seconds, so n time equal eight, and the number of output step, so the number of points or frames which be used for animating the maneuver or plotting and writing the table of your results. For example, 800 steps. So I decide time and number of steps of analysis. This is a, a kinematic analysis. So I click on play and in an interactive way, you can appreciate extraction of the flap and rotation of the left spoiler. The analysis has been performed and now I can visualize my results in many different ways. For example, I can now move here in correspondence of this icon which open the animation dialog box. So click on this icon and using this new dialog box, I can review the analysis without the need to repeat. I simply review the analysis so I can visualize the results all the time I want. And I don't spend time on this, but because I have no time, but you can create a different point of view. You can trace trajectory of points. You can superimpose the animation so you can see the full volume occupied by the flap and the spoiler. And this is very important to evaluate the clearance problem between the flap and the aircraft, for example. So you can see this kind of animation. But what I want to show you now is the post-processor activity. So you can click on this icon here to open the post-processor or you can click on results and open the post-processor, or you can click on F8 on your keyboard and open the post-processor window. And in this window, for example, you can select the body. We have three, six, 10 different rigid bodies. We can select, for example, the flap. We can select the characteristics of movement of the center of mass of the flap. And we can plot on the window the movement along X global position or along Y position or Z position. And the same for the speed. Velocity along X, velocity along Z, or acceleration along X and along Z, or all together. And the same for the spoiler. And the same for other components. So you can investigate the kinematic behavior of your system. But you can also investigate the energy content. And if you see, select constraint, and these are the constraints in your model, you can ask, you can investigate the reaction forces 
in correspondence of the joint. So, which are the loads where you have a connection? And you can see if there are high value of these loads, not in a specific configuration, but following, investigating the behavior of the loads, the modification of loads with respect time, for example. So it, it is a much more complete analysis with respect to static analysis or a configuration only analysis. We investigate how a load change during the maneuver. And we can plot, for example, the power required by the system to move the flap. Or we can also investigate, for example, the, the torque or the force required by the actuator to drive our flap and our spoiler. So the kinematic analysis is fundamental for understand the behavior of our flap to see if everybody moves in the right way and if the level of reaction forces of the actuator forces are in the limit we have for our requirements. So you can close this window and you can go back to the main window of um, our uh, flap. Now, if you go to tools, uh, read command file, and you load the file number three, called three flap measure, You have the same model as before, but I have created for you some important measures on this model. So if I run an analysis, in, instead of investigating thousands of different requests, I focus my attention on these eight, nine specific measures because they are important for this, my preliminary kinematic investigation. For example, I have created displacement of the center of mass of the flap. I have created the force to actuate the, 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 the flap and the displacement and velocity of the actuator part. So these are the measures. And I have also created for you under simulation, two different simulation. So you can simply select the first one, kinematic simulation, or the second, a simulation with a failure, because with the first analysis, I simulate when the flap behaves in the right way. And in the second analysis, I want to investigate which is the behavior when an actuator has a problem. So I simulate the failure of a motor. So my flap can move in any way even if I have only one actuator, which is the loads on a specific joint when one actuator fail. For sure, I have a different distribution of loads because only one actuator push the flap. The other is broken. So I need to see which is the difference between a good behavior and a behavior with a failure. So I go to simulation, but now instead of creating from myself 
and analysis. I simply go here on this symbol, which allows me to run a script. So to run an analysis already defined. So click on this icon, open this dialog box, and in this field, using the right button of the mouse, I search for the analysis, sorry, for the script called simulation kinematic. This is an analysis with no failure. So click on play and the analysis is performed. I want to save this analysis because I need to compare the result of this analysis with the results of the analysis I will perform later with a failure. To save an analysis, I go on this icon here, click this icon, and in this field, I decide a name, A1, the first analysis. A1 key, K means first analysis with the kinematic model, A1K. This analysis now under results is saved. So this will be available also in the future. Now I change the script. So I select the analysis with a failure. In this analysis, I simulate that a actuator, one, the internal actuator or the external actuator, fail. So there is no more the actuator pushing the flap in the internal side or on the external side. So I run the second analysis. And as before, I saved it with another name, AK1, A1K underscore fail, which means failure. Or if you want to call A1K fail to give a name to this analysis. The name is uh, without space, uh, so you can decide any kind of name, but without using a space in the name. Now, if you go to the post-processor window and you start with uh, an empty page, you see here how to create an empty page. I can select analysis one, the analysis one with a failure. And instead of all results as before, I can decide to focus my attention only on specific measures. And you see here the measure I have created rotation mov movement of the flap force on the actuator and displacement and velocity of the actuator we have a kinematic model so my system behaves correctly even if i have a failure in the system so if i select the rigid flap measure and I click on add a curve, I see that the flap behaves correctly. So only one actuator is able to drive correctly my flap. 
all the joints are rigid, all the motion are ideal. So, from kinematic point of view, that is from the displacement point of view, there is no difference. And it is a great result because if I, if I am able to size, to dimension the actuator in the right way, I can find an actuator able to work for a limited amount of time with the same power provided by two actuators. So even I have a failure on my flap system, the pilot can fly and go back to the airport with no problem. So the flap can be extracted and the, fly, the aircraft can, be, uh, can, can fly and can land. And this is important results. So in my design, I have to guarantee that even if I have a failure, the actuation system is able to move the flap. So if I look in the same page, clicking on surf, I can, uh, I can uh, um, update the same page or without clicking on surf and clicking on new page, I can create a new page. It's up to you. You can investigate the different behavior on the flap. So the flap behaves correctly. But what happens to the actuator? If I click on the motion force, I can see that the actuator fail. So there is a brutal change in the force provided from the other actuator. Let me show you the other force. The red curve is when the actuator works well. The blue curve is when you simulate the failure of the external actuator. The force goes from this value to zero. The actuator doesn't work. And if you go back to the previous page, you see that the internal actuator has to replace, has to um, push the, actuate, the, the flap. So you need the more force, more power to the internal actuator in order to move the flap. So when I size the motor, I have to consider I need an extra power for the actuator because I have to consider the possibility of a failure. And I have also to investigate how much time this actuator can work with this value of force. Because if I work for hours, probably I have a problem. And in fact, you know that an aircraft is certified that every component in the system of an aircraft must assure that if another computer fails, it works at least for a couple of hours because a, an aircraft is certified to fly in uh, failed condition for at least two hours to approach the closest airport. If you don't have this kind of certification, you cannot certify your aircraft to fly, for example, across Europe or across the ocean, etc. So this is a simple example, but this is the idea you have to, 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 to design. You have to design these kind of things. 
So you have this uh, information. Okay, and investigate other things. But now I need to replace the ideal actuator with a, a more realistic force, which is the realistic torque or force provided by, by my motor, by my actuator. So instead of a motion with respect time, displacement with respect time, I go to tools read the common file and I load the number four for flap dynamic model. It is the same model as before, but now you can appreciate that we have forces applied to, to apply the, the actuation instead of motion, which are deactivated. This symbol means that the motion are not active. And the law for the actuation, the dynamic law, is much more complex with respect to the law of motion. We have that to consider a control system able to drive the a body along the axis of another body, considering the limit of the force and consider the limit of the displacement. I cannot move a body for uh, an infinite uh, space because there is a geometrical limitation. So if you expand the function here, you can see a more complex function to simulate the movement, the, the actuation from dynamic point of view. This is another advantage of the code because in any moment, you can <clears throat> move from the dynamic model to the kinematic one, simply deactivating the force and reactivating the motion. Again, with only one model, you can investigate many different things, increasing the complexity of your model. So now we have other script of analysis dynamic simulation because it is not more a kinematic simulation and a dynamic simulation with failure. So we can go to simulation, simulation script and search here the script called simulation dynamic. If we run this analysis, and we save this analysis with the name A2D, means second analysis, D means dynamic. Now I can go to the post processor and selecting as before measures, I can compare the behavior of a kinematic model with respect to the behavior of the dynamic model. So we can compare the rotation of the system, sorry, the, movie, the displacement of the flap. We can simulate, we can compare the displacement and velocity along the, the, the actuation, and you can see different time for achieving position. Why? Because I change the ideal movement, uh, which is a, defined in a specific amount of time with a dynamic movement, which has a different frequency of application. So I see here, for example, that the flap uh, achieve the final position, not in three seconds, but in 
more than one second. So changing the actuation parameter in my force, I can decide the speed of actuation. So I can increase the time for actuation or I can reduce the time for actuation. For sure, changing the actuation time affect the speed. This is the red curve is the curve of this velocity of the actuation and this sharped curve is the <clears throat> velocity in the dynamic step. And everything is also modified for the other results. For example, if you switch from measures to results now, and you select something in the model. So for example, I select one joint and I click on the component. I can see difference in behavior on this joint. In the kinematic system, I have no force on the roller in the slider. In the dynamic behavior, the roller slide dynamically on the guide and I have a force. So I move from kinematic model to a more realistic one, a dynamic model. And I can see similar effect on other characteristics of my flap. So I can plot different curve achieving different results. And this is important for investigating my system during the analysis from kinematic point of view and from dynamic point of view. But imagine now what is, could happen if I simulate the failure of an actuator in a dynamic model. So I select the other script, dynamic failure. I run this analysis. I save this analysis with another name, A2D fail. And now if I compare the kinematic analysis with failure with the dynamic analysis with failure, I will also appreciate different between results. And you see here the difference. And you see here other difference. And when you have a dynamic failure, you, could, you can appreciate that you can have a spike because the system abruptly fail. So you receive a extra load somewhere in the model. And with this output, you can appreciate the value of this increased load. And you can see if my system can work with this increased load. So this is uh, another uh, evolution. What we have performed? We have simulated the kinematic analysis. Then we have, uh, these are some results. Then we have simulated the failure, and these are some results. Then with the kinematic analysis, we can use a simple model for fast analysis, for preliminary verification of functionality, for preliminary sizing of actuator, but we are not mod modeling 
the real actuator and there is no structural information. So we have to increase our model. So we have introduced the dynamic model, replacing the ideal motion with realistic, more realistic actuator, and comparing working, uh, the model with works and the model with failure, we can appreciate the difference between the kinematic model and the dynamic one. With the dynamic model, we can appreciate the inertia effect. We start investigating vibration. We can start investigating disturbances. That is, if you have compliance in somewhere, you can have problems in the connection and in the functionality of the flap. You can have locked up position, so the system can have a jamming position. For sure, we have increased the complexity of the model. It means not only more effort, but that you have to introduce the realistic law. I showed you before that emotion is easy to define. Question is, is function of time. Instead for a real actuator, I need to know the size of the, the stroke, the limit, stiffness, the limit of the maneuver, etc., etc. So I need more knowledge about my physics. Okay? And now I show you a movie with uh, a failure on uh, a more realistic model. This is a model with uh, two flaps. And in these two flaps, I have one body, sorry, I have one actuator, which is failing. When an actuator is failing, the other actuator push the flap and the flap start to rotate in the wrong way and goes in contact with the other flap or with the aileron. And this is dramatic for the aircraft because the pilot has not only a failure on a flap, but the full wing can be affected. And the pilot must be very, very smart, be able to fly an aircraft using only one wing and with the usage of the rudder and the elevators. So you have to land without using the other flaps on one side of the aircraft. Believe me, it's a very, very difficult task. And you have to simulate all these conditions when the flap can have a failure, at which kind of rotation, at which rate of speed of rotation. I have a contact with the flap, I have a contact with the aileron, I have a contact with the fuselage, there are, there are other parts which goes in, in interference, I destroyed, I destroyed something else. So these are thousands of different conditions you have to simulate because you cannot ask a pilot to, to go and fly with failure condition. So the failure condition can be realistically tested with a realistic flight only when you have investigated all the possible situation and all the possible consequences. Okay? This is another important aspect of, uh, of simulation. Now we go to the flexibility. Every wing, every flap must be simulated uh, with the flexibility. So you need to perform a finite element analysis in order to find and to extract the flexibility 
flexible characteristic of your flap. So you move from a simple rigid body model in which the only important thing is mass and inertia to a more realistic model in which you have also distribution of structural matrix and damping. So you have deformation, stress, fatigue, uh, investigation of your, of your flap. To make a flexible model, you need a finite element solver. So you perform your investigation in the finite element solver. For example, in this case, I have used Nastran, our code, and I run all the analysis in order to extract the important information about flexibility. So I have provided to you the model. So please go back in Adams and we have to replace the rigid flap with a flexible flap. First of all, we go under measures and we remove the measure on the rigid flap because the rigid flap will be replaced. So I don't need more the measure on the rigid flap. So I select rigid flap delta I, the x, the y, the y, and the z. Go to edit, go to delete. So I remove this measure. To make a body flexible, there are many different methods. The simplest one is to replace with one click the rigid model with the flexible one. I can do with it with one click because I have spent the right time to create the model with a finite element code. So go to rigid flap, select it, go to make it flexible. You have the possibility to start from scratch. This is not our case or to import the, to the, to import the flexible data from the analysis you, we have performed. You imagine that we have performed this analysis all together, so we can click on import. And in this dialog box, I search on disk a file called flap.mnf, which is the extension for the flexible content of this flap. So selecting this file and clicking on OK, now I have a flexible flex instead of the rigid flex. I don't like uh, this name here. The code automatically add underscore flex to the previous name. I don't like this name. So please go on the body, flexible body, right button of the mouse, and click on rename. So instead of the original name, please use flex underscore flap as new name. So this is the flexible body. I can appreciate that it is a flexible body. Why? Because if I go to flexible body modify, 
If you remember, when I select a rigid body and I click on modify, I can appreciate the inertia characteristic of the body. Now, if I select flexible body modify, I can open a more complex dialog box in which I can visualize the frequency content that is the stiffness matrix of my uh, flexible body. So clicking here, I can analyze the frequency content of my flexible body from numerical point of view, but we can also visualize the mode of vibration of my flexible body. That is how the body can deform if we apply on it a specific loading condition. If, we, if you insert in the mode number field, the number seven, which is the first flexible mode of vibration, and you click on enter, you can see here the representation of the deformed shape of your flexible flap, and you can also animate this mode of vibration. This is a mode of vibration. This is not a deformation of the body, but the combination of all mode number, this is the second mode of vibration. This is the third mode of vibration. This is the fourth mode of vibration you can appreciate how the, bo the body can deform combining all these modes at different frequency. And we have 88 different modes of vibration because we have to consider many, many different loading conditions. This is part of my finite element analysis. The this is a finite element body, sorry, this is a flexible body. In fact, if you click on capital S, you see the mesh of your flexible body. So you can appreciate that it is a finite element body. This mesh is, I admit, horrible to see due to the limitation of a student edition. We can use only model with 5,000 nodes in the student edition. And this is the reason because the model is not so nice to see. If you have the full Adams, we can use and we can have much more fine mesh but it is not important for the, our purposes. So this is a flexible body. So if I now run a simulation, for example, the dynamic analysis with the failure using the flexible body, you can appreciate uh, during the animation that you have vibration and deformation. And if you save this analysis with the name A2A3F, means analysis number three with a flexible body and fail, you can go to the post-processor and considering the measure, you can compare what happens when you replace a flexible body with a, replace a rigid body with a flexible one. Your result change again and you have vibration in the system. And this vibration must be considered because your system during the flight vibrates and the vibration affected and influence the reaction forces 
and influence the support structural characteristics and influence the full performance of your aircraft. So if you look, for example, for example the behavior of uh, some um, forces, you see here different between dynamic model with a rigid body, a red curve, and dynamic model with a flexible body, the blue curve. And you have to consider this oscillation and this vibration. And this is not enough. Let me give you the last information. Now we have to include aerodynamic force in our model. So we perform aerodynamic analysis considering the rotation of the flap with respect to the aerodynamic field and we extract the aerodynamic low and in condition during the extraction and retraction of the flap. So we investigate using a finite element code how are the aerodynamic forces in the different position of the flap. So we run the aerodynamic force depending on time, rotation of the flap, rotation of the spoiler, speed or Mach number of our aircraft, etc., etc., etc. So go to forces and the aerodynamic force on this flexible body is a special force here. You can select this button. You can select the flexible body. And you can define how the flexible aerodynamic, the aerodynamic force are applied on the flexible body. Now you insert one only to create a dummy aerodynamic force because I have created for you the complex aerodynamic force and you can simply load this force from the disk. So go to tools, read command file, and you can import the aerodynamic force. The aerodynamic force is now much more complex depending on time and depending on the displacement of the flap and of the spoiler on the, um, this, this part. Now, if we run a simulation analysis with the failure with also the, C, the aerodynamic force applied on the system. So we run also this kind of analysis. And we save, we call it the final analysis. So it is easy to remember. Now we can do many, many different activity for post-processing. First of all, we can compare what happens in my system if I have a failure considering the aerodynamic force or not. So this is the behavior of the flap when you have failure with no aerodynamic force or with aerodynamic force. The movement of the flap 
change. And you have to consider this. All my investigation must be reviewed due to the fact that what I have preliminarily defined with kinematic analysis must be uh, is mo little bit mo a little bit modified or modified uh, uh, heavily due to the flexibility due to the aerodynamic force so your actuator your clearance analysis everything must be reviewed considering also the other things and the preliminary analysis have been absolutely important because you have clarified everything in your model from kinematic point of view and from rigid body point of view so now you can focus your attention on the effect on the flexibility only and the flexibility aerodynamic force only imagine if you start immediately with the model with flexible bodies with aerodynamic force you have no idea about anything and your investigation can be a complete disaster because you cannot move on your results again you have gigabyte and gigabyte of results and you have to extract the important characteristics for example if you go to plugin and you click on durability you can ask the code to give you which are the region on the flexible flap more affected by the failure analysis so where i have where i have the most important stress value and how the stress value change during the maneuver so i can for example go to durability hot spot table and for this flex flexible flex and for the final analysis we have performed i can print in a report i can print as output which are the node and where are the node and at what time i have the highest value of stress so this is a table providing me information about where i have the crit more critical condition of stress and this information can be can be visualized by report by curve by movies etc etc to make things more let me say easy to understand from qualitative point of view i can go to the post processor i can switch from plotting to animation and if in this animation window i use the right button of the mouse to load the final analysis i can visualize as you can read here the deformation of the model or go to counter plots you can visualize the stress on your model if you change the minimum and maximum value it is much more easy to 
appreciate. So insert 100, uh, insert 1 million. And during the animation, you can appreciate the region which have the most important stress condition. If you insert 10 million here, you can appreciate. And it is evident that the region with much higher value of stress are in correspondence of the connection of the actuator with the flap and actuator with the, the sliders. So these are the region with the, the, the greater effect of stress. Again, the, the movie is not nice to see, but due to the uh, mesh simplification due to the condition of our flap. <clears throat> the last uh, information is through the PowerPoint. If I need to <clears throat> if I need to actuate uh, with a sophisticated model of control system, instead of uh, using uh, a control law I show you before, I create uh, my hydraulic system using easy five or using uh, other tool in the market uh, able to create uh, this kind of uh, hydraulic circuit. And uh, I apply the output of this hydraulic circuit uh, as force in atoms. So I run a co-simulation between the hydraulic circuit and the atoms model. In this way, I will have at the end a full flap with structural characteristics, with applied aerodynamic forces, and with sophisticated hydraulic model. So I have a complete mechanical model working in parallel with a complete hydraulic system. And this more or less close the, um, the workshop because we have at the end uh, included all the discipline in this design uh, um, of the flap activity. So in one hour and a half with, uh, uh, with this explanation, I, I hope, I guess, you see how you can decide to work in your company in different department with different competence with different technologies but uh, making all this technology integrated in one environment in which all the discipline can collaborate all together <clears throat> okay how to go to the hand to this uh, workshop. The evolution of simulation, the introduction of the concept of digital twin and the introduction of the concept of uh, um, actual learning for uh, uh, running uh, um, artificial intelligence analysis, let me say, uh, for your uh, design. First of all, what is a digital twin? Sorry, I have to check on one second the chat.
Okay. Mr. Kadarani, that was uh, me just saying excellent okay. Okay. Uh, in terms of timing and uh, everything. Sorry. Uh, okay, thank you. So, uh, with a, a very, very, I apologize for this, in a simplified way, we can call digital win a digital copy of a complex system. To achieve the digital win, you need to not only to simulate, but you need to include in your modelization the possibility to measure the, um, the data using a measurement system. When MC Software three years ago was acquired by Hexagon, which is a, a, a company um, st strong in system of measure, we close the loop because we had the possibility to um, make the digital design and simulation and, and at the same time immediately to evaluate and capture and monitor the behavior of a physical system. So, let me, so what we want to, want to do or what we are doing in, today is to move to, towards what, we, what is called the smart factories. So the company, every industry is introducing the typical digital transformation which means that they introduce device and system for connection to improve and use in a better way all the data of the simulation and allowing the system to become more and more autonomous. What this means that if we consider all the tool we have so before, or part of the tool we saw before from numerical point of view. So about structure, about um, dynamics, about uh, CFD, but we have also material, acoustics, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we combine, we merge the virtual world with the real world of sensors. We can fuse in one unified world the, uh, the model to, to make a link between the real world and the digital one. And uh, this is possible because you have or should have the numerical tool. You have software for CAD CAM production like machining tool or uh, sheet metal fabrication tool, etc. And tool for calibrate, to measure, to make a dimensional analysis. What is a sensor? Is something in the system to create signal, which gives you the possibility to capture the operation of the physical world. And the data are captured and transformed and integrated to the numerical model. And you have some analytical technique to use in the right way this data. And your actuator move considering the output from the analytical analysis. So you move continuously in this environment from physical to digital, from digital to physical. And the objective of the digital twin is to identify all the deviation from the optimal condition and for sure how to reduce cost, how to increase the efficiency. For sure, to get a digital twin from a physical asset, you need knowledge and competence about the functionality of the system. And increasing this know-how allows you to make the digital model more and more autonomous, as we can see later. So again, to enforce 
this message, the digital twin allows the user to be informed about the behavior of the system, informed about the improper behavior of the system, and about the deviation respect to the desired or expected status of the system. And you can simulate in the digital environment and not in the physical one, reducing time, effort, and cost in order to find solution to uh, restore the expected status, et cetera, et cetera. So the digital real world and the virtual world now working in this process from the design to the service. They, they move in parallel, continuously. And let me show you a movie for this. You can simulate and measure your results of simulation. So you design, you produce, and then you measure. And there is a continuous transfer of information from one side to the other side. Design for production, production and measurement for reverse engineering. So you can improve the quality of your model using also the physical measurement. And you can uh, verify the goodness of your digital model measuring uh, the product and uh, uh, working uh, together between the digital world and the virtual and the virtual world. So you have uh, many instruments for dimensional inspection. You have uh, instrument for uh, uh, metrology assisted manufacturing. You have a system for uh, allowing uh, autonomous operation. So in which way you have your digital world in which you run your simulation. You can use digital analysis with co-simulation as we saw a little bit before. You can simulate, for example, monitoring process, improving the quality of your product. You can evaluate using measurement the goodness of your process. So you can evaluate the structural characteristics of a component created by additive, for example. And this is important in order to reduce the error and the defects of this kind of process. You can use measurement for uh, make uh, reverse engineering from physical to digital. So you can improve the numerical model using measurement. And this process is a continued process from measure to uh, simulation to product. And this is a typical uh, approach in the smart uh, factory from digital to real and vice versa. <clears throat> so this is uh, the concept of digital, uh, of the digital twin. If we use also this concept, considering the virtual reality, you can also imagine or understand the advantage of this kind of numerical and digital investigation. What is machine learning instead? The possibility to create true simulation, predictive models, reduced order models, which are, can be analyzed with very, very fast uh, simulation because you make the algorithm of the machine learning trained enough using 
numerical data and or numerical data combined and empowered by measurement. The algorithm of machine learning learn and the reduced model will, will be able to be executed thousands of times in seconds instead of minutes or hours, allowing you to predict your data in a very, very short amount of time. Again, nothing is magic. There is a great effort in acquiring good training data from good numerical model, acquiring good measurement data from good measurement tools, combine them together to make the algorithm good to be, to be executed. You have some environment able to manage the data and able to create the reduced model. And you have some tool for running a design of experiment analysis. And the, the idea is, if I have to make a landing condition simulation and any single analysis in a numerical tool require eight, eight, uh, more than eight minutes, if I train my algorithm of machine learning with 15 simulation, changing different parameters, for example, the flight angles, and uh, asking for a specific output, I can get a reduced model, which is able to run a simulation in one second. So I can run uh, eight uh, multiply six, 500 simulation in the same time I run one simulation with a model numerical model tool. This is another example. This is a crash, crash uh, test with this finite element model or with the equivalent reduced order model. Three hour for the crash test with the numerical model, two seconds with the algorithm, reduced algorithm. I need seven, 17, 20 runs to train the algorithm. So we use three hours, multiply 20, so 60 hours to, to create the, the base for the machine learning algorithm. And then we, are, we will be able to run in a very fast uh, time uh, the simulation with the algorithm. For sure, we need to be good. We need to be master. We need to be expert. Again, this is the last time I say this, but we, nothing is for free. It's a question of years to become expert in the numerical tools. It's a question of uh, years to become expert in the me measurement tools. So you must be expert to make these two environment uh, good for a machine learning autonomous uh, uh, activity. But today, after, let me say, at least 50 years of development of uh, numerical tools, we are uh, good enough. So this is uh, an application. There are many applications in many different industries. So I have completed my <clears throat> presentation. And uh, maybe there are some minutes, if you have, if you want, for, uh, for questions. I, I imagine that you are tired because I didn't stop, but I, I have a lot of things to say, and I hope to have covered uh, everything. Uh, so I open the question and answer session, if you want. You can write uh, here, or you can write using chat, or maybe you can also send me a question uh, by email or you can join my virtual booth next Thursday 
and I will be available for uh, for trying to answer your uh, question, curiosity, doubts, uh, etc., etc. Professor, you uh, you are the, the 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 chairman of the session, so it's uh, also up Mr. to you. Mr. Catalani, thank you very much. So we 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 are uh, actually ready for um, some questions, interactions. You know that you can raise your hand if you look at your uh, toolbar. Let me show you here. If you go, you, you probably uh, saw here in the toolbar that you can use Q&A for questions or you can raise your hand. OK, so I believe it was um, uh, excellently delivered, Mr. Catalani. Um, we are also very well aligned with the timeline. We have uh, the moment 31 participants. Okay. Maybe everybody needs, needs a break. <laughs> yeah, actually, Mr. Catalani, um, I want to mention that you didn't uh, stop for a single minute uh, throughout <laughs> the workshop. Uh, so you didn't um, even consider a short break, uh, which actually uh, was fine because it was uh, still very, um, uh, easy to, to, to follow. I mean, the base was uh, very well uh, uh, tuned to, to just um, be in line with your uh, presentation. Uh, yet, a few minutes of break um, may be needed. Uh, according to the schedule, uh, we are supposed to run the workshop until um, one, so we have only a few minutes left. Um, I want to ask you, Mr. Catalani, uh, in terms of uh, projects uh, that you are uh, personally uh, consulting and you are aware of within MSC, uh, can you um, tell us a little bit about maybe the most challenging project uh, that you have in your hands, uh, of course, from the point of view of simulation and um, in general also optimization. Uh, and uh, a second question is, in terms of developments of the software, um, what, what do you think is going to be the next step? Um, of course, we saw the digital twin, the use of artificial intelligence, uh, but uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on what is the computational challenge that you see in these new uh, endeavors? Okay, regarding, <clears throat> regarding the activity, uh, more or less uh, similar to what I have uh, shown um, company, uh, aerospace, automotive, and general machinery uh, needs to um, define a numerical model uh, more similar to, more close to the real model. So they want to introduce uh, many, many uh, details. Uh, the problem is that sometimes uh, they want to introduce details, uh, but they have no data for these details. So they create a geometric representation of the detail, but stiffness characteristic is missing, damping characteristics are missing, friction characteristics are missing. So geometry is not enough. 
we need uh, parameters to make the model physical, physically good. So uh, one, one thing to emphasize is that uh, there, are a, there is a great, a great emphasis on the geometrical representation of the models, but uh, is still missing uh, a calibration of the parameters in the model. And this is uh, a problem for us because uh, at the end uh, we, we, if we, as using in English terms, if we put inside a model trash, we get out trash. So there is no... May, may I ask you, uh, Mr. Catalani, from the point of view of sensitivity analysis with respect to these uncertain parameters in the model, um, how is it uh, typically run? I mean, what, what kind of um, efforts are currently put into this kind of study? Uh, uh, is, is, is increasing because, uh, again, to get, uh, the re to get a real model, we need uh, more realistic parameters. So damping and friction are two, for example, two basic uh, data that uh, needs uh, calibration and uh, they are, there is uh, uncertainties of these uh, parameters. Another important uh, field of investigation is about uh, uh, deviation from uh, ideal uh, configuration. So assembling problem, manufacturing error, defects. So I don't want, they don't want to, uh, or they cannot uh, uh, redesign, but uh, they want to understand uh, which is the deviation from the perfect behavior if you have uh, some uh, defects, acceptable, acceptable defects. This is another <laughs> field of investigation. And the last is uh, um, parallel computing in terms of uh, development of solver, because if you want to run a co-simulation using <laughs> finite element code, CFD code, multi-body code, control code, you need a, 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 a big tank, a big, a big gun in your hand because you need a, a very, very um, important source of, the, of, uh, um, of uh, capability of computation. And uh, in this case, uh, you need parallel computing or the possibility to uh, find, as machine learning is doing, the possibility to reduce the model in a way that uh, results are good enough, but uh, predictable in a very, very short amount of time. So from one side, they need more power for, for computational effort. From the other side, they search for, uh, we are searching for uh, algorithm able to reduce the model in a good way. This is the, this is the, 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 the trend. And, okay, the last, but this is not uh, uh, recent, uh, what is called uh, in an horrible uh, term, democratization of uh, uh, CAE, but uh, democratize, uh, doesn't mean uh, a black box or a magic button on your, in front of your face. It, it, is, it needs that you, you must be able to manipulate a model, a complex model in a more easy way, but uh, without neglecting or forget, uh, forgetting that we are engineers, not scientists, but engineers. So we need to know uh, what we are doing and not uh, let the code uh, do something for us. Otherwise, results are only movies. Thank you, Mr. Carlani. One, okay. one more question, which was my original one. Uh, what is the most challenging project that you okay. have ever faced okay. or you are currently facing? Okay. Uh, one of the most challenging projects was the helicopter project I show you, in which uh, uh, we have to develop a specific routine able to manipulate aerodynamic forces on an helicopter landing on a carrier ship because we have uh, everything <laughs> to, to model. And uh, this is an activity we, I performed many years ago, but uh, not every year, but uh, frequently there are a request for uh, update, uh, for improvement. Uh, so it is a never, never end, uh, never end uh, uh, project.
okay. I'm well aware of this kind of project because um, it, it's now uh, two decades ago that I was also uh, working on a Navy project at Virginia Tech. Uh, it was a cargo transfer between two ships, you know, the, the main ship and the um, cargo ship. Uh, the career and the cargo and so we had you know two moving um, two moving bodies the ships and then you have the transfer of the load uh, through a crane and uh, so it was quite an interesting um, problem <laughs> to to work with um, I really wish to thank you Mr. Carlani for um, your excellent uh, workshop I see also some comments here. Uh, I invite, um, of course, the panel, the um, workshop attendees um, that are not currently uh, panelists here in terms of um, capability to, to talk and to provide uh, immediate reactions, but they have uh, a poll that uh, is available right after the meeting. Uh, so they can rate uh, the workshop with a few questions, so it will take only uh, one uh, 1.5 minutes uh, at most. I want to thank Mr. Catalani and also MSC Software for um, the workshop and for also being uh, one of the sponsors of Nodicon. Uh, it is really a privilege to, to be associated with you, Mr. Catalani and uh, your company, uh, because we see the driving power um, of computations and, of course, science that go together uh, because there is, uh, you know, the whole body of theories uh, being implemented into these powerful codes. But uh, this has to, of course, be um, available and um, somehow be um, in the hands of engineers working in companies. Uh, so it has to be, as you said, um, at the end of the day, um, runnable, manageable uh, in, in uh, normal computational frameworks. And uh, I believe that this is going to be the uh, challenge in the future is, as you said, to make all these codes, um, these integrated, uh, uh, platforms uh, more democratic from the point of view of uh, allowing, uh, let's say, a, an easier access and easier interpretation. Again, um, there is a person who raised the hand. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't see because it just came in. Uh, let's see. Who is this? Yes, Professor Stangel. So please uh, allow Professor Stendhal. It's great to see you. Okay, oh, nice also to see you. Do can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. We okay. can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just pressed this button accidentally, but I enjoyed the talk. It's very interesting for me to look at. And was just wondering how many people are working on such a project which was presented. I think this is a group of at least. 20 persons or more. Sorry, how, 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 many, how, how many persons? So how, what is the, how many persons are working on such a project? A single engineer cannot take everything into account. Okay, so uh, for example, in the project of uh, helicopter uh, on a ship, uh, me, a colleague of mine, so two guys from my company and uh, a couple of guys, uh, three guys from the helicopter company. Uh, all of them, all of them, uh, uh, comp competent in a specific discipline: structure, CFD, and uh, dynamics. Thank you very much, because I think it's very important to have a lot of people with different uh, sure. capabilities. So. Sure, sure, sure. In fact, uh, nobody of us uh, can know everything. Yeah. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. uh, the collaboration in the code means also a great collaboration in the company. So the department has to work uh, in a collaborative way and also the main company has to work in a collaborative way with the suppliers. Otherwise, uh, the process some, somewhere uh, is stopped. Okay, so uh, th 
Thanks very much to Professor Steindl from Technical University of Wien. Um, uh, it, it was great to see you all uh, in this workshop. Uh, again, I think now for a um, uh, matter of timing, uh, we will have to uh, stop here, say goodbye to everybody, and uh, especially thank you again to Mr. Catalani. You are welcome. And uh, was an honor. enjoy the rest of your day. We will uh, start running a second workshop at 2.30 on continuation techniques using MATLAB and a toolbox, which is called COCO by Professor Dankwich. Thanks again and have a good day. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.